So first on our program today, uh, we have the, the esteemed chair of the Douglas County Democrats, Alana Lenahan. Welcome, Alana. Hello. Thank you so much for being on the show today. <laughs> oh, it's my pleasure to be here. So you were just recently elected. Uh, when did that happen? Uh, January 25th. We just held our election. So um, <coughs> just a couple of weeks. Cool. And uh, Douglas County is is very interesting because even though you're heavily Republican, you've got a very active uh, progressive group that's been growing and growing down there for years. And and one of our first uh, allies in the in the anti LNG fight was Douglas County. It was Douglas County that joined with Clatsop County in 2008 and got the first resolution passed opposing LNG in the Democratic Party of Oregon. That was two chairs ago. So yeah. we have we have we have fond feelings for our friends in Douglas County. <laughs> so tell us uh, what happened to your representative. To Jeff Cruz? Oh, this is this has been a, a, in the works, and and it started. I, I know that there's been a lot of focus on the sexual harassment, but I think that really the death knell for him as our senator started way back with his disregard for the law regarding smoking in the building. That was a very big telltale sign about how he felt he was above the rules. And and then when the sexual harassment claims started coming out, those accusations coming out, there was a lot more ability to believe the accusers because we already knew he disregarded the rules. He didn't he didn't he felt that that was beneath him to to have to do the same thing that everybody else did. So um, it, it's really startling. I haven't read the full report, but I've read a lot of it. But we're talking about behavior that goes back almost the entire time that he's been in the legislature. And that's that's really startling. Um, it's startling that it was tolerated for so many years. Even if it wasn't reported, the report says that multiple occasions of this harassment are shown on videotape on the legislative <laughs> floor. <clears throat> So, I mean, <laughs> it had that means that other people saw it and it was tolerated. Nobody said anything, and that's really frightening. So, yeah, we talked about this on the show a couple of months ago when it first broke, and uh, uh, I was astonished because every, you know legislators always talk about how hard they work in Salem and all the long hours they put in. It's like, where does this guy find time to do this kind of stuff if you're so busy? Mm -hmm. uh, and then for everyone to be complicit. I mean, Salem is a very cozy little group of people in the in the Capitol building, and and there I, I doubt if there's much that goes on that not everyone is aware of. And so for everyone to have tolerated this for so long is is really uh, astonishing. Exactly. Well, and it's really been um, reading Facebook comments and ar comments on articles for the News Review and the Oregonian from people who live here in Douglas County about his behavior and how he's just a good old boy and we should just let it pass and we don't understand it's an age thing it's a generational thing he didn't mean anything by it that's I I you know I think I walk the streets with these men who feel that it's okay to to behave this way this is that's really scary uh, yeah, I was I, when I visited you a couple of weeks back. I was walking back to the car and I passed uh, uh, a church sign and it said, "Jesus loves me, this I know." And you just don't see signs like that uh, up up in the metro area or even in uh, where I live in Clatsop County. Um, it's it's a whole different culture down there. So how 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 good of a representative was he for you? Did he represent you, the people, and did he meet with you and and carry your carry your concerns to Salem and fight for I've, you? I've been really active here in Douglas County for about four years, and I know of one town hall meeting he's held in the four years. So no, he doesn't represent, he doesn't represent the entire population. Um, he, he definitely has never been open to hearing opinions outside of his party. Um, it's, it's been appeared quite obvious on from an outsider standpoint that he takes his direction directly from the Republican Party locally and on the state level, um, that he's not there to represent his constituents, he's there to re represent his party. Uh, when I was looking uh, for a picture last night, I came across the results from the 20, 2016 primary and uh, his opponent uh, 
got 15 percent of the vote in the primary and Jeff Cruz got 80, 85 percent of the vote. That That's just an overwhelming uh, vote for someone who doesn't seem to do it, <laughs> doesn't, didn't seem to do a lot for the populace. Um, what was yeah, going on there? I, I think it's in, in, I know for Douglas County, and I, I can't speak to Coos and Curry County and those small portions of Jackson and Joseph, Josephine County that are in his district, but I know here it's all name recognition. This is a good old boys club. And they want to know, they just want to know your name and they mark the ballot. Most of the voters here are not engaged in the process. They're not looking at the issues. They're not paying attention to the voting record. They just know that they know that name. And so they mark the ballot. So there's not really any conversation about what you stand for or what you're doing on the legislative level. Um, so, you know, we have a completely uninformed voter base. And that's just the people who vote, much less the people who <laughs> don't vote. And I mean, which is a huge percentage, especially here in Douglas County. So, um, but yeah, we just, it's its really frightening. It really is. Have, I know you've got, a, you, you've given a lot of thought to this um, and uh, we haven't found the secret sauce. Uh, do you, do, do you, do you have, have you come up with a strategy on how to talk to people about issues that are, are relevant to them as opposed to relevant to a, a party philosophy? I'd have to say no. Um, we're working really hard on it, but I know that every time I enter a conversation, like back when Measure 101 was going uh, going on, and I would enter a conversation and I'd say, explain to me why you're opposed to this. Just, I wanna know what why you're opposed to it. And they would give, some unfounded reason, some reason not based in fact on the actual measure. And you, you you go, okay, I understand where you're coming from, but did you know that it actually says this and not that? And then they shut you down. So it's it, we're in this, um, they're just in a bubble and they don't want to hear what you have to say. Um, I think I think for us here locally, the the strategy that we need to have is to pull the people who are progressive or left-leaning or even moderate out of out of the shadows because they're here, but for so long we've been dominated by the Republicans that they're afraid to stand up, they're afraid to make their voices heard, and they've just quit voting because they feel it's they're never going to win. So we need to pull those people out and start talking to them and not talking to the people who are never going to agree with us. It all goes back to us getting uh, and demanding that we take our democracy back. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know how, I don't know how, <laughs> at some point you start sounding like a crazy person. It's like, what do you mean our democracy is gone? So we're going to talk a little bit later in the program about uh, democracy and the status of that. But uh, it's like everyone has to get active and everyone has to understand how their rights and their democracy has been taken away from them. Uh, and they have to start demanding it back. And you would think that something like healthcare, where it really is a life and death matter. I mean, if you don't get treatment and you have a terminal disease, you're going to die. And so, uh, you know, I just, I'm, I'm, I've just enter, entered retirement and turned 65, and uh, I, I'm starting to understand how screwed up the system is. I, for years, I never went to the hospital because I'd always been generally healthy, and now that I've, I've been exposed to it, I. It's just appalling that this country has a system like that. That and there's two different things. There's our deliver. There's our 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 research and development, which is first class and top of the world. So yeah, we can we can research this stuff. But it's our delivery system of the healthcare that sucks and needs to be fixed. And I just you know we just spent months talking about DACA and and it's like. Really, Democrats, have you forgotten all about health care? Is that is that put to bed now until what you take over the majority at the end of this year? Is that is that the plan? I don't know. What, I don't know what's going on. It's it, yeah, it, and and I will have to say, my generation, um, part of your generation, we disengaged from this whole political process. Um, things were, you know, if you look back into the '70s when we were coming of age, um, things were good. We had a 
fairly decent middle class, things were going well, and we thought our government was doing what it was supposed to be doing. So we sort of disengaged and we let them do their thing. And now we're reaping the rewards for that because, you know, we didn't follow through. We didn't pay attention to our vote. We didn't pay attention to what the government was doing. And you can see the degradation over the last 40 years. I've, I've been working my way through Ken's Bur Ken Burns' documentary on the Vietnam War. And uh, apart from the good parts of the 70s, there was the Vietnam War that was going on uh, and, and in the 60s. And, uh, and the protests were far more uh, uh, extensive than I realized at the time. I, I was living in, uh, you know, a rural part of the West Coast, and so I, I, you know, I never saw what was happening in the big cities. But you know, I was watching that, and it just felt like what has been occurring in the past couple of years, where people go to demonstrations and they do protests, but they they have not realized that the real path to power is who they elect into office, and so. Uh, you know, the, I'm hoping that it, by the time I get to disc 10 of the set that we that he talks about what was happening with our elected officials and was anyone trying to elect anyone differently? Because until you change who is in office, you are not going to get a change in behavior. Yep, exactly. Exactly. And, and that means being an educated voter and and paying attention to the issues and knowing who you're voting for and actually voting. Um, you know, if we look back at the last presidential election, if the people who didn't vote had actually voted, I mean, that that, is, that was almost the majority of the eligible voters who didn't vote. So that could have completely changed the, the results of the election just by that huge number of people who didn't vote, which I believe was over 48%. It was a very large number. Yeah. And... <laughs> Betsy, do we have any questions on the line? Apparently I not. Don't see any, no, I don't see any questions. <coughs> I got a question. So uh, you're so this primary of Cruz, is, this is the Republican primary. Was there a Democratic challenger, and how well did they do? Or is this a really super red district? It is a very red district. Um, he did have a challenger in the general. Um, let's see, that was Tim Rolick, and he got about 26.5% of the vote. Ouch. Um, and Tim Rolick is, was a fantastic candidate. He did have some personal stuff that came up in the middle of the election process. So um, he was physically not here for a short period of time, which um, I think affected his campaign. Um, but, um, and that, that was reflected in the numbers. I think if, if uh, he had been able to focus entirely on the campaign, he would have done much better because um, he was a great candidate and he's a great guy. I've met him on several occasions. I've actually talked to him last week um, and he's, he's just, he would have made a fantastic legislator. Can you, yeah, and we were talking in green room. Can you explain the process of how, uh, now with Cruz's departure, how you will, a new, person will get picked because it was a little confusing it is it's, it's very confusing and maybe uh, larry may know may know more than i do but the way it was explained to me what's going to happen is the county commissioners for the five counties that are included in this district will meet and they will come up with three to five candidates to replace Cruz. um and then well, excuse me let me back up the republican party in those five counties will meet and come up with three to five candidates uh, to replace Cruz. And then the county commissioners from those counties will vote and they have weighted votes. So um, like Cousin, or excuse me, Curry County is fully um, encompassed in district one. So it will be based on population. They may get a little bit heavier of a vote because of the population count or it may swing to Douglas County. I haven't actually pulled the numbers to look at them to see how that's gonna go. Um, so those those county commissioners from those counties will vote, and then they will they will make the replacement. Now the really interesting thing is is that they don't get this done in 30 days. My understanding is Kate Brown will will appoint a replacement. So um, so that's you know that I'm sure that with that on the on the horizon, the Republicans are going to be all over this to make sure that they get a replacement done. Um, and then after that, the Democratic Party will meet. Um, and we will actually select a candidate to run in November because because it's been more it will be more than 61 days until the next general election. 
we will actually have an election for Cruz's seat come November. So we will need to find a candidate to run in that seat. And um, depending on who the Republicans pick, who the county commissioners pick to fill that seat, it could be a really interesting election. So who uh, who's who are the names that are being talked about as a possible replacement for Cruz? The ones that I've heard floated around on the internet right now are Dallas Heard, uh, David Brock Smith, and then um, surprise, surprise, Tim Freeman, who is Douglas County Commissioner. Um, which really surprised me that that would that would be somebody they would pick. I know he he served in the legislature before, and he said it really wasn't his cup of tea, and he came back to run as a county commissioner. So um, I'm not sure if somebody's you know just throwing out a rumor or if that's something that he's actually looking at. Um, you know, it's it's like somebody said on Facebook yesterday. There's a huge money difference between a county commissioner position and a senator's position. It's about fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> so I don't I don't know where to, which way he'll go. But um, if Tim Freeman is picked, and if that's who their selection is, that actually opens up um, a really interesting scenario here in Douglas County because that will open up his county commissioner seat which is actually on the ballot in May. Um, and uh, it, their selection will not, probably will not be out, announced until after the end, after the filing date for th that position. So what does that do for us as a county commissioner candidate? Um, hopefully we can pull somebody, you know, that will run against him on the off chance he takes it and then he can run, he or she could run unopposed. Uh, and I, and I wasn't, for those of us not, who don't live in, in that area, uh, give us some background to the other two candidates. Um, David Brock Smith is a state representative for district two, I think. And then Dallas Heard is, no, Dallas Heard is the state representative for district two. David Brock Smith is the representative for district nine. I could be wrong on his district cause I'm not, it's not anywhere near my district, so I'm not 100% sure, but he's a state representative. Um, David Park Smith is fairly new, my understanding, and I don't know a whole lot about him. So, uh, but Dallas Heard is dumber than a bag of rocks. The man has <laughs> not an original thought. <laughs> Anybody who's ever heard him speak will tell you that he, there, there's just not a whole lot going on there. Um, he is, there, yeah, he take he he specifically takes all his instruction from the Republican Party because he cannot come up with a thought on his own. So this sets up the same dynamic that we've often seen in the Democratic Party, where a representative moves up to a senator seat, and then you go through the same process that you described for the replacement of the representative. And since they're all mm -hmm. Republicans, uh, the replacement's still going to be a Republican, but it does open up an opportunity. Uh, for uh, a Democrat to have a, maybe a better chance since they're not running against a, a locked-in incumbent. Right. And David Brocksmith and Dallas Herter are both up for <coughs> election election this year. So if either one of them takes Cruz's the seat, then, you know, we have, we have an open position there that we could run a candidate in. So... Um, well, that, that's mind-boggling what happens. <laughs> so it's, then they, it's really complicated. It's a lot more complicated than I thought it would be. Yeah. So the Republicans then, if if one of the representatives moved up, then and it's after the filing date, then I believe it's the Republican parties, again from the counties that would come up with a candidate to to replace him on the ballot to run in November, um, uh, right, in the general. Right. Cool. So, so what we have to do as progressives, uh, Democrats, independents, non-affiliated voters is find a candidate for those positions just on the off chance that one of them is picked, because that actually gives us some leverage. Because if we're run, if we have a candidate that we're prepared to run, and they have to bring in a candidate at the last minute, we'll we'll have a leg up. Yeah. So at least we can hope we have a leg up. Yeah, and we talked about this before, and it's it sort of flips the 
the power of the PCPs that we've talked about in the previous uh, editions that the Democrats have. Now it's the Republican precinct committee people who uh, mm -hmm. actually will be voting on the replacement for one and possibly two members of the legislature. Uh, and it's one of the, the duties that comes with being a, a precinct committee person. Um, and as everyone should know by now, the uh, forms are available to run for a precinct committee person, and you have to file it with your county clerk by by March 6th. And you can, I believe you can actually fill out and submit the form online. I haven't heard that far, but <laughs> <laughs> I would, I personally wouldn't trust the system. I would walk down physically with a copy or with someone I trust to physically hand it to the clerk. So there was no... No, no ambiguity about uh, having turned in the form. I have a really funny story about that. The first year, first time I was elected as a PCP, I didn't even know I was running. Somebody had handed me a form and I signed it, not knowing <laughs> what I signed. <laughs> and and when you showed I saw, up on the ballot? Like when I saw my name on the ballot, I'm like, what the heck? How'd that happen? Um, Betsy, any, any, any questions on the, on the line? Alana, any final closing remarks you'd like to say today? I'm just hoping people are paying attention to what's going on with Jeff Cruz's seat because this is a great civics learning experience and this is not something that happens a lot. So I just really hope people are paying attention and it creates some, some interest in what's going on it's on the state level and on the local level um, as far as what, our, what politics is doing and, and what our government's doing. So 